would you please stand with me uh, now and, and welcome our own uh, Dr. George Black. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Love you. Yeah, love you. Thank you. Woo! All right. Well, God bless you. I want Jehu to run up here real quick before we get started. Where's Jehu? Did he slip out? Jehu, run up here, man. Uh, I'm sorry. He's a judge. He's out there judging chili. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to see so many teenagers in the house. Run up here real quick. Come on, run, Jehu, run. We just announced that next week you're going to be our guest speaker. And of course, we're looking forward to hearing from Jehu next Sunday, but then on the 15th we'll be praying over him and sending him to be a, a, you know, a colonel in the army and, uh, or a lieutenant or something. But he's going to be a leader in the army. He's joining our armed forces to uh, serve our nation, and we're going to be praying for him every day till he comes back. Amen? But Jehu, I know that the teenagers are going to really come out to support you next Sunday, and we really want our teens to come. It'll be a great day. Is there anything you want to tell us about next Sunday? Don't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss it. Well, we've got a whole row of teenagers over here that Jackie has brought today. Let's just give Jackie a big hand. Thank you, Jackie. And... Uh, I know you guys saw him playing drums. After the 15th, he's gone. We need a drummer. So if you guys know anybody, let us know. We need a bass player. We need a guitar player. We need all the help we can get. And teenagers often have that. So uh, you guys help us if you can. But everybody invite somebody next Sunday. And let's pack the house for a great, great teen emphasis Sunday. Amen. Thank you, Jehu. God bless you. He's out there judging chili. Hey, Jehu, Kathy. <laughs> Everybody thinks that I tip, I tip them. I don't tip them. I put a 20 in their hand. I'm just kidding. Turn me up a little bit right here, Pastor. I, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. All right. But uh, anyway, we're looking forward to a great, uh, a great chili cook-off. And I want to just ask how many of you here this morning are rooting for either the Seahawks or the Patriots in the Super Bowl today? How many of you? Are you rooting one way or the other? How many of you are rooting for the Seahawks? Okay, four. All right. <laughs> Maybe five or six. How many of you are rooting for the Patriots? Any Patriots? Two? Okay, good, good, good. Three, God, God bless you. About four, all right, we're getting close. How many of you are rooting for the Cowboys? Woo! Do the wave, do the wave. All right, next year maybe. Anyway, we're going to have a lot of fun with the game, those of you that will be watching it. But I want to share a message with you this morning about the Super Bowl in the kingdom of God. And I want to start with a little funny. Is that okay? I want to start with a little funny. It's a, it's a special day today, so I want to start with a little humorous story. And uh, it's, it's about Jack had received a free ticket to the Super Bowl from his company. Unfortunately, when Jack arrived at the stadium, he realized that the seat was the last row in the corner of the stadium. He was closer to the Goodyear blimp than the field. About halfway through the first quarter, Jack noticed an empty seat, 10 rows off the field, right on the 50-yard line. He decided to take a chance and made his way through the stadium and around the security guards to the empty seat. As he sat down, Jack asked the gentleman sitting next to him, excuse me, is anyone sitting here? The man said, no, help yourself. Very excited to be in such a great seat for the game, Jack said to the man next to him, This is incredible! Who in their right mind would, would have a seat like this at the Super Bowl and not use it? The man replied, Well, actually, the seat belongs to me. I was supposed to come with my wife, but she passed away. This is the first Super Bowl we haven't been together since we got married in 1979. That's really sad, said Jack. Couldn't you find someone to take the seat? A relative? A close friend? No, the man replied, they're all at the funeral. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> the folks. <laughs> that's that's the way some fanatics really are. I want us to be fanatics about God's team. Look, it's just a game in the natural, but God's got a real team. And how many of you know we need to have a winning team in our lives? And I want to talk to you about five things that will help you to be a part of a winning team in the kingdom of God. Are you ready? I want to give you five things. Let's turn in our Bibles and let's start with a story. And it's the story of Abraham. He used to be called Abram before his name was changed. But we're going to find where Abraham actually went to war. And it's the very first battle that's recorded in the entire Bible. How many of you would like to know what that battle was about? Okay, all zero of you. <laughs> I, I can tell I'm, I'm winning the game right now. Okay, thank you, Pastor. All right. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Genesis 14, this isn't necessarily the first war that took place in the history of humankind, but it's the first war that is recorded in our Bible. And it's the story of how five kings who were under this overlord by the name of King Keterleomer, maybe in your Bible it says Cheterleomer, kind of reminds me of cheese, but uh, this particular king and three other kings were overlords to five other kings. And these five other kings decided they didn't want King Ket Keterleomer to be in control of their kingdoms anymore. So they rebelled. They did the throw the tea into the harbor thing, just like we did uh, when the United States was rebelling from England. They threw, uh, they threw the king's tea into the ocean. And here's what you and I need to real about, realize about this. It made King uh, Ketoleomer really mad. And so he came after them. He gathered his three other kings and he came after them. And here's the story of the battle. Are you ready? In Genesis 14, 8, the Bible says, Then the rebel kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, whoo, got a little affirmation going on in this place finally. Zeboam and Bela, also called Zoar, prepared for battle in the valley of the Dead Sea. They fought against King Keterleomer of Elam, King Tidal of Goam, King Amraphel of Babylonia, and King Arioch of Eleser. Four kings against five. As it happened, the valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits. And as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into the tar pits while the rest escaped into the mountains. The victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. They also captured Lot, Abram's nephew, who lived in Sodom and carried off everything he owned. But one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abram, who later became Abraham, the Hebrew, who was living near the oak grove belonging to Mamre, the Amorite. Mamre and his relatives, Eskel and Aner, were Abram's allies. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men who'd been born into his household. Then he pursued Keterleomer's army until he caught up with them at Dan. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. Keterleomer's army fled, but Abram chased them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Abram recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. After Abram returned from his victory over Keterleomer, and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, 
And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe or a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. So here's the story that we're looking at. These five kings rebelled against their overlord, King Keterleomer. King Keterleomer got three other kings together, and the four of them invaded and won the battle. They chased all those other armies out, and then they took all the spoils of war, including their wives, their children, and their food, their animals, their herds. They took all of that with them, and they were on their way back to their home. Well, guess what? When they were in the process of gathering all these spoils of war, it just so happened Lot, Abram's nephew, was living in that particular region. And they just took his stuff as well. Took all of his family members, took all of his wives and children, took all of his herds and just took them as spoils of war even though they hadn't been a part of that battle. Well, guess what? Somebody escapes uh, from this particular battle and they run to to uh, uh, Abraham who is living in another region and they get to Abraham and they tell Abraham Abraham your your nephew Lot and all of his families and everything he owns has been taken captive by King Keterleomer well you know at this particular point we need to understand a little bit about Abraham Abraham was a wealthy wealthy man he had so many flocks and herds and servants and wives and he just had so much stuff that he had to have a trained army in order to defend all of this stuff. How I many of you know when you're that rich, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? And so here's what the Bible says. The Bible says he gets his 318 trained servants and he goes after that army. Now that's kind of amazing, isn't it? I mean, we don't normally think of Abraham as a man of war, but I want you to know something. Uh, they, had, they had done something they shouldn't ought to do. They had attacked his family. Are you with me? And all of a sudden, the Super Bowl was on. I'm here to tell you, the Super Bowl was on. It was going to be Abraham's Patriots, or Abraham Seahawks against King Keterleomer's other team. And I want you to know something. He made up in his mind he was going to win before he ever went to battle. Now let me give you five keys that will help us to understand how we can be on a winning team. How many of you like to lose? You don't like to lose? Are you sure? All right. Well, let me teach you this morning how to be on a winning team. Are you ready? Number one, know your values. Abram went to war because he valued his family. The first thing you've got to make up in your mind is what are you living for? Not, not what are your opinions, but what are your convictions? Let me tell you something about opinions. Opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. But convictions are something you'll live for and you'll die for. Abraham knew his values, and one of his values was family. He was committed to family. You touch anybody in my family, and you've touched me. Did you know that's the way the body of Christ ought to be when the devil comes in? The Bible says uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Can I tell you, sometimes that standard is our brothers and sisters going to war with us, standing in the gap with us. You get sick, somebody's going to, they're going to, they're going to go to battle for you. Somebody's going to pray for you. You're going through a hard place in your life, your marriage, your, your circumstances, whatever's going on in your life, your finances, somebody in the body of Christ is going to value you enough to go to battle for you. Are you with me? But you got to be in the family of God for that to happen. All right? You've got to be in the family of God and you've got to know your values. Now, Abraham went to war because he valued his family. And here's what 2 Timothy uh, 3.1 says. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. 
For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Do you know right now, there are so many things in our society that people no longer consider sacred. They no longer consider marriage between a man and a woman sacred. They no, no longer consider the life of the unborn child as sacred. And so we're living in the fulfillment of the teachings of these scriptures. I'm not throwing stones at anybody that's made mistakes. Like I've said earlier, we're all sinners saved by grace. But folks, once you get saved, God wants you to adopt His values. You see, a lot of times what happens to Christians is they get born again, but they keep living in Egypt. What do you think God wants to do? Leave you in Egypt? No, He wants you to come out of Egypt, and He wants Egypt to come out of you. The Bible says, He that's in Christ is a new creature. What happens? You adopt the, the King's values. You see, it doesn't matter what your opinions are anymore. It doesn't matter what my opinions are anymore. All of a sudden now, the values of my Heavenly Father become my values. Are you with me? You know, that's what we call a Christian world view. Is that we're not viewing the world secular. We're viewing the world through the Bible, through the lens of the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. And so they will be boastful and proud, consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. Wow. The lack of self-control in our society with, the, with just, just the immorality and the, and the rape and the, and the murder and all the things that are going on in our society. Folks, I know that when I say these things to you, you think I'm really from a different world that I've come from another planet. But when I was a boy, we didn't lock our doors at night. When I was a boy, my parents left their keys in the car. The world has changed. This is no longer, this is no longer my dad's Oldsmobile we're living in. Oldsmobile doesn't even exist anymore. Pontiac doesn't even exist anymore. Two of the greatest cars GM ever made. And so we need to realize that in changing times, you need a secure foundation. You need values. See, because the values the world holds today aren't the values they'll hold tomorrow. The world changes its values every generation. But the Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We need to go back to the Word of God. Amen? And so he says they'll be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. What did the Bible say? Stay away from people like that. Why? They'll corrupt your, your values. They'll corrupt your values. All right. Jesus loved sinners. He ate with sinners but he didn't go with them in their lifestyle. 2 Timothy 3.10 says, But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You, in other words, Timothy, you know my values. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. When Abraham heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, Abraham went to war because he valued his family. What are your values? What are you willing to go to war about? Are you with me? If you want to be on the winning team, you've got to know your values and you've got to stand for them. You see, if you, if you, if you don't know your values, you're not going to stand for them. You see, you're just going to be wishy-washy. You're going to be double-minded. Let's make up our minds to let the Word of God be our final authority in everything. Whether it fits my opinions or not, I, I have to understand that I am imperfect. I am incomplete. But God, His wisdom is perfect. He knows better than I do. Even when I don't understand, I can trust Him. I can believe in Him. I can have faith in Him. 
You say, Pastor, how do you believe in someone you can't even see? The same way you believe in things every day that you can't see. I, I, I just wonder how many of us could really explain it, electricity. But you walk in the room and you use the light switch anyway. You don't understand how it works necessarily. Oh, I know you could probably give me a scientific explanation. But do you really know where electricity comes from? And so you stop and think about, well, I use that electric switch every day because, hey, it works. I may not understand it, but I get to use it. Do you know how a microwave works? Do you understand how... Uh, I can remember back in the day, I can remember back in the day when cell phones were just starting to pro proliferate. And somebody asked me, how does a cell phone work? Well, now I could explain to you a little bit more about cell towers and how all of this stuff is transmitted to satellites and we have these uplinks and these downlinks. And I, I could share with you some basic information, but I want you to understand something. Most of us do not have a practical knowledge of how cell phones work. I bet every one of you use them. All right? So believe in God that way. Even when you can't understand Him, understand that His wisdom is perfect. His Word is perfect. God can be trusted. Not the opinions of men. Tomorrow their opinions will change. How many of you have been around long enough to see all the different diets? Kathy and I have been married for 40 plus years now, and, and I want you to know, it seems like every year somebody comes out with a new diet. Do you all remember when they came out with the low-fat diet? Get fat out of your life. And all of a sudden, we started getting fatter. Get fat out of your life. Why? Because now we were eating all these sugary sweet products. We were eating all these carbs and and all of a sudden, our society got fatter. And then they said, well, just eat protein. And then they said, no, just eat this. And just, How many of you know they're going to change it next year? Go back to the Word of God. The Bible has diet plans. There's a Daniel plan. You and I need to understand that God's Word is perfect. And it always works. Praise the Lord. All right, now. Number two, the first one is know your values. Abraham went to war because he valued his family. Number two, know your strengths. Touch your neighbor and say, do you know your strengths? Do you know your strengths, all right? Abraham had trained his team. They were born into his vision. The Bible says he mobilized the 318 trained men who had been born into his household. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. What are we talking about here? Know your strengths. Well, Abraham understood that he could go to war because he had already trained his team. Did you know every one of us need to be training others to help us with what we're doing in the kingdom of God? When it always depends on you and you alone, you don't have a team. So when you show up, it gets done. And when you don't show up, it doesn't get done. Abraham knew that he couldn't be the cork in the bottle. He trained his team. And so he knew his strengths. And by knowing his strengths, he also knew his weaknesses. And he knew that one man couldn't run his empire. He had 318 trained servants. They were born in his house. What does that mean? They were born in his vision. All 318 of them were dreamers about the Abrahamic vision. They believed in where Abraham was going. They believed in the vision God had given him. And they were willing to lay their lives down for it. So where there is no vision, you've got to have a vision of your strengths and how to train others to help you be strong. Amen? Where there is no vision, the people perish. Another translation says... The people run unrestrained. You know, if you don't give people a vision, they'll make up their own. Everybody has to have a vision for their life. Most of the time, though, their vision for their life is not God's vision for their life. So you have to give them God's vision for their life. You have to give them a Christian worldview, a 
of why they exist, why they were born, what God's great big plan for their life is. You see, one of, one of the aspects of God's great big plan for our lives is that we weren't put on this earth to, to just amass wealth and get a lot of things and die with the most toys. That's not God's plan for our lives. Now, don't misunderstand me. God doesn't have a problem with money. The Bible says the root, of, uh, the root of all evil is the love of money, not money. Did you notice that? The root of all evil is the love of money, not money. And what does that mean? That means people who don't have it still love it. You say, oh, a rich person, they have a hard time going to heaven because they've got so much money. Yeah, but if they don't love it, it doesn't matter. You say, why? Money is a tool. And until you see it as a tool to serve you, you will worship it. And so here's the thing about Abraham. Abraham was filthy rich. He was amazingly wealthy. But he honored God. You'll see later on, he gave God a tithe of everything. Why? Because he knew where it came from. Are you with me? And so you and I have got to realize that when we're not tithing, it means we're worshiping our money. Because we don't know who really gave it to us. Oh, I worked hard for that money, Pastor. Oh, did you really? Well, who do you think gave you the strength to work? Who do you think gave you the opportunity? Who do you think gave you that, that job to start with? And you're not going to honor God? Look, Abraham knew his weaknesses and he knew his strengths. And where there is no vision, the people run unrestrained. They create their own vision. You remember when Moses went up on the mountaintop? God gave him the Ten Commandments, wrote them in two tablets of stone. What happened when Moses came down from the mountain with those two tablets of stone? The people that he had left behind developed their own vision. Instead of waiting on God's vision, they went ahead and the Bible says they created a, a calf of gold and began to worship it. Well, folks, we still have calves of gold. People worship what money can buy, what money can do. It's an instrument. It is only for the service of humankind to fulfill the will and plan of God. And you and I need to realize if God makes us wealthy, it's not for us to drown in the gravy. It's for us to pass it on, to do good with it. Amen? I mean, really, how many cars can you drive at one time? How many pairs of shoes can you wear? at one time and so you know people just keep buying more and more and more and more stuff can I tell you it's not about getting more it's about doing are you listening to me now I'm kind of I'm kind of hijacking last week's message and some of the things that we've been talking about with our pledges for the new year and being faithful to God but I want to tell you something uh, Abraham knew his strengths and he knew his weaknesses and he trained his people in the vision uh, the Bible also says where there is no, instead of the word vision, it uses revelation. Another word is divine guidance. Where there is no divine guidance, the people perish. You know what, folks? I hope you believe when you come to Rejoice Church that you're being given God's vision. You're being taught God's word. That you're finding God's plan for your life. You're being trained in the vision of God's house. Amen? Amen. That's what God wants us to do, is train our 318 uh, servants to be men and women of God, born in the vision, and able to win the Super Bowl for Jesus. Amen? So number two is know your strength. Abraham trained his team. that They were born into his vision. Number three, are you ready? Number three, know your enemy. Know your enemy. Abraham knew he was going against a superior force. I mean, look, Abraham wasn't a king. He had a huge, if you could say it, a huge kingdom. He had his empire. He had 318 trained servants besides women and children and wives and donkeys and all these different uh, camels and herds that he had. But I want to tell you something, folks. He was going against a superior force, and that's why the Bible says, there he divided his men and attacked during the night. He realized, oh, they've got a lot more, they've got a lot more warriors than we've got. So here's what we're gonna do. 
we're going to have a multi-front attack. And we're not going to wait for the morning. We're going to attack at night. Guess what? Those 318 fearless soldiers went up against those four kings and their armies while they were asleep. And the Bible says they ran. They ran like dogs. I want to tell you something. When you start using God's wisdom to fight your battles, your enemy will flee too. You know, the Bible is a robber and a thief and a liar. And a lot of times he's lying to us, talking about stuff in our minds and in talking to us all the time. And if you're not careful, you listen to it. You'll think he's this big bad wolf. But remember what the three pigs said. You can huff and you can, you can bluff, but you can't throw, blow this house down. Not this brick house. You can't blow this one down. And how many of you know if you build your life on the, on the rock, which is Christ Jesus, you'll be able to defeat your enemy even when it looks like he has a superior force. Here's what Ephesians 6.10 says, a final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand against all strategies of the devil. Another translation says the wiles of the devil. Do you know the devil is wily? I mean, he is, he is absolutely a, a, a constant evaluator of your strengths and your weaknesses. That's why sometimes he pushes your buttons. Do you know why the devil pushes your buttons? He knows your weaknesses. Yeah, yeah. And can I tell you, if you don't fight him over it, He'll push it again. A lot of times, here's what happens. Oh, God's really doing something in my life. Oh, I went, I went to rebuilding the altar's prayer, and boy, the fire of God's coming alive in my life, and uh, I'm repenting of my wicked ways, and I'm, I'm getting right with God, and then all of a sudden, the devil pushes that button. He's pushed a hundred times. And he goes, well, I'm not going back to prayer this week. Just don't feel like it. Besides, CSI is on. And you know I can't miss CSI. Because if I miss it, I, I won't know what happened. And, and, but here's the thing. You're willing to miss what God is saying. And you won't know what God is doing. You won't know what God is saying. You know, when I was younger, we used to have church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night. And then we had permit. Now, some folks can't even get out of bed on Sunday morning. Ask them to come back Sunday night and, whoa, Pastor, you better be feeding us. <laughs> or at least have a little bit of ice cream. I'll come out for the ice cream. <laughs> Look at Martha. She's, she's waving at me. And, and, and then Wednesday night, well, you know, I'll be there if I can. Most of the time I can. I come home from I come home from work so tired, Pastor. I'm just I'm just always so tired. I'd rather just sit home and suck air. Well, I want to tell you something. You never go to church when you leave and say, Boy, I'm sure sorry I went. Why? Because you always get energized. You always get filled up. You always get encouraged. You always get something good. Come on, shout a little bit. Talk to me this morning. Help me. Help me, church. Now, I know I'm not talking about any of you because you're here. But here's what I need you to understand. Whenever you don't feel like coming to church, that's just the devil pushing your button. And the only way for you to get the devil out of pushing that button is to come on in. you got to run over it. You've got to absolutely be a, a Tony Dorsett or an Emmett Smith, and you've got to push him out of the way. Or somebody today, who's a, who's a modern running back? Oh, yeah. What's his name? Marco Murray. Is it Marcus Murray or Marco? DeMarco Murray. There it is. Yeah, he's a crazy, amazing train. He loves to run over people. Come on, buddy. I'm not, I'm not going out of bounds. We're going to hit. I love the way DeMarco Murray runs. He, he is a freight train. But here's what you got to know. Jerome Bettis was one of those. 
How many of y'all remember Jerome Bettis from the Pittsburgh Steelers? That, bu that buddy was absolutely a crazy man. But here's what you got to know. The devil's waiting to call your bluff. You're going to step out of bounds before you hit me, aren't you? No, sir, not today. You're not pushing my buttons again. I'm coming for you. You say, well, you fight the devil like that? You better believe it because I already know that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has won the battle. Somebody says, don't stir him up. Don't make him mad. You don't understand. He's already stirred up. He's already mad. He's going to keep you under his thumb just as long as he can until you rebel and you push him out of that place in your life. And when you push him out of that place in your life, then Jesus begins to get glorified and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you begin to defeat that superior force with the wisdom of God and with the power of the Holy Spirit. Next week, he won't fight you there anymore. Or not many weeks he will. All right, he'll go looking for some, uh, some other button he can push. And he may find one and he may not. But you just got to call his bluff. You got to call his bluff in Jesus' name. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. And so be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies or wiles of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So know your enemy and you'll be on the winning team. Praise the Lord. Number four, two more to go and we're going to finish. Number four, know your commitment. I loved what, I loved what our dear minister Maria said today about the offering. Declare yourself. Make a commitment. Don't just be moved by your emotions. And one week you'll give, and the next week, well, Pastor, if you don't move me, I'm not going to write it today. Well, be, be faithful to God. Don't give it to me. Don't give it to this church. Please don't. Be faithful to God. What does He want you to be committed to? Not just in your finances, but in every area of your life. What does He want? Make your commitment. Abraham was committed to nothing short of victory. Here's what the Bible says. Abraham recovered all the goods that had been taken. And he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. Here's what I believe Abraham decided. I believe Abraham decided. Hey guys, he's talking to his 318. You know, not 11 on his team. He's got 318 on his team. I'd like to see any team in the NFL be bad. And so, and so here he comes with his 318 servants and he says, hey guys, I want to talk to you before we go to war and I want to let you know we're all in. We're not coming back without Lot. We're not coming back without his family. We're not coming out back without his stuff. And all the guys said, yes sir, we're in. You've got to know your commitment. You see, a lot of times Christians are a little bit wishy-washy about their commitment to God. It depends on how they're feeling. Now, do I really feel like I want to be committed today or do I just kind of, my faith's a little bit low today. And You know what, folks? You're going to be committed to what you really want to be committed to. Amen? I mean, we can either make a plan or we can make an excuse. It's up to us to decide how we're going to serve God with our lives. Every day you get up, make a commitment to be God's man. Be God's man at high school. Be God's man on your job. Be God's woman wherever you work. Be God's woman wherever you serve. In other words, God wants us to be committed before we get to the problem. You know, I've seen some drivers that just absolutely about killed me. They must get their driver's license at Walmart. Kmart. Kmart. I'm sorry. God bless Walmart. <laughs> if you ever seen somebody, and I honestly, I've had several accidents this way. If you ever get in by, behind somebody and they're about to enter the interstate, and they're on the own ramp, and you know, everybody's just zoop, zoop. I mean, they're coming by at 60, 70 miles an hour. 
Well, you know good and well if you're going to merge with traffic, traffic, you better go faster than 15. And so here, here's this half mile entry ramp and, they're, and, and they've got their little car. I mean, they've got that car rolling 20 miles an hour now. 25 miles an hour now. We're about to hit, you know, light speed. And they get to the end of that ramp and instead of merging, they stop. Has anybody ever seen that happen? Has anybody ever done that? Don't raise your hand. Can I tell you, that doesn't work. That's not how to drive. And that's not how to live your life. You've got to make up your mind before you hit the own ramp what you're going to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're just watching the traffic and you, oh, oh I might be, no, 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 I can't make it now. Oh, oh I, 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 no, no, there's an 18 wheeler. You've got to get up to speed. You've got to be going 50, 60 miles an hour and just whip it on in there. How many of you know that's how you drive? But some Christians, some Christians, nobody here today, touch your neighbor and say, he's not talking about you. But some Christians, every day, their commitment is whatever the traffic looks like. What will I do today with my life? Well, if it looks convenient, I'll serve God. But look, if it's not, if it's not convenient, I'm just, you know, I just don't know what my commitment's going to be. How many of you know that's not the kind of disciple that followed Jesus? That's not the kind of trained servants that followed Abraham. Are you with me? Now, folks, I'm preaching to myself because every day I have to fight the same flesh temptations that you fight. I have to fight the temptation to be weak. I have to fight the temptation to be wishy-washy. I have to fight the temptation to back up on my commitment to God. I have to fight all of those temptations just like you do. But can I tell you, if you're a committed man, you're going to be there. I want to just ask you a question. If you're a part of the NFL, and we're talking about Super Bowl here, aren't we? If you're a part of the NFL, let's say you're a part of either the Seahawks or the Patriots team, and it's time for the Super Bowl. The coach looks around, and uh, one of the players isn't there. Tell, tell me the name of some of those players. Tom Brady, that's one of them. German. Okay, so coach is looking around. He's going, oh, where's Tom today? Well, you know, Tom didn't have a good night's sleep last night, coach. And he just felt like he'd sleep in today. Uh, what team is he on? He ain't on my team if that's the way he's going to play. How many of you know, even if you're playing Little League, how many of you know, these parents are says your kid doesn't practice your kid can't play and we're not that serious in church we're not that serious in our Christian commitment hey guys I'm just being honest with you let's apply the same standards let's be committed to what God has called us to do let's make sure our kids are in growth track classes let's make sure that our kids Go to Wednesday night Bible study. Let's make sure that God is being glorified in our kids' lives. Let's make sure God's being glorified in our lives. Are you with me? I'm just about through. And so God wants our commitment to be nothing short of victory. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, And let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due season and at the appointed season... We shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. Are you with me? The final one, number, number five. Are you ready? Three of you are ready. Let me ask you again. Are you ready? Somebody says, please hurry, Pastor. I smell that chili. Number five, know who to thank. Know who to thank. Abraham knew it was God who helped defeat his enemies. 
Here's the scripture. And blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Here's my scripture. Romans 13, 7. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Owe no one anything. Don't owe taxes. Don't owe customs. Don't owe fear. Don't owe honor. Owe no one anything except love. For he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the fact that once you've won your battle, remember who to thank. Remember who to bring the trophies to. Can I tell you, I'm just a weak, failing human being like everybody else. But sometimes with God's help, I get strong. With God's help, sometimes I find courage I didn't know I had. Sometimes with God's help, I get faith and vision that I didn't know I had. And so a lot of people say, oh, pastor, we really appreciate your, your leadership. We really appreciate that message. We really appreciate how hard you work. But let me tell you something. When I get home at night, I bow my knee to Jesus. And I give him all the trophies. And I tell him, God, without you, I can do nothing. Without you, I'm a nobody. And no matter what somebody thinks I've accomplished, it didn't come through me. It came through you. And you've got to know who to thank. And you've got to give him the praise that's due his name. And you've got to give him the honor. And you've got to give him the, the recognition that he's due. So let me give you these five keys to winning in the Super Bowl of the Kingdom of God. Know your values. Abraham went to war because he valued his family. Number two, know your strengths. Abraham had trained his team. They were born into his vision. Number three, know your enemy. Abraham knew he was going against a superior force. God gave him wisdom to win. Number four, know your commitment. Abraham was committed to nothing short of victory. And number five, know who to thank. Abraham knew it was God who helped him defeat his enemies. Give him some praise. Give him some praise. Now, I want to ask you a question. We're going to pray. Do you want to be on the winning team? The winning team is God's team. Because at the end of the day, everybody look at me, eyeball to eyeball. At the end of the day, when your life is over, there's only two places we're going. Heaven or hell. You can argue all you want to about there is no heaven and there is no hell, but I want to tell you something. When it's your time to go, you better wish you were wrong if you didn't believe. Or if, 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 yeah, you better wish you were wrong or you better, you better hope you were right if you didn't believe. Because I want you to know something. Jesus said this. He says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. I need us to understand as Christians that at the end of the day, the goal of our life is to take others to heaven with us. To win one more for Jesus. All right? To help them live for Christ and to go to heaven when they die. Because folks, when it's all said and done, there are no second chances. All right? There are no second chances. God's not going to bring you back as a cat or a mouse or, or, a, or a cow so you can try again. That's just foolishness. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. You and I will be judged for our sins. And if your sins have already been judged in Christ, you'll go to heaven. But if your sins have not been judged in Christ, You'll have to pay for them yourself. All right? Bow your heads with me right now. Father, we love you and we thank you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in, trusts in, and relies on him would not perish but have everlasting life. 
Lord, I thank you that today we've learned about being on the winning team, God's Super Bowl. Lord, we, we thank you for the fun and games we'll have today with, with our, our natural Super Bowl, and football and basketball and all these wonderful sports that we enjoy. Well, Father, help us to look beyond this to the real battle that goes on, the real game of life that exists beyond this game. God, we pray that every person here today would be on your winning team. But Lord, if there's anybody here today that does not know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life, Lord, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that, Lord, you would draw them to your love right now. It's your love that draws you to surrender. It's your love that draws us to repent. It's your love that helps us to say yes. Because, Lord, we've never known any love like your love. And so, Lord, I just pray right now that by the power of your Holy Spirit, if there is one person here today that doesn't know you in the depth of their heart as their Lord and their Savior, Lord, I pray, bring them to you right now. And I want to just give that invitation. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But if you're here this morning, you'd say, Pastor, pray for me that I would know Christ as my Lord and Savior that I would know Christ as the forgiver of my sins, that I would know Christ and I would know that I'm going to heaven. If that's your request this morning, let me pray for you. All I ask is that you just lift your hand right now. Let me see. Is there one person here today? Say, Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. Let me see your hand and I'll pray for you. Anyone here today? Today's your day. you to put your hand on your heart let's just pray out loud together a prayer of rededication just say father thank you for sending jesus to die for my sins so i don't have to i ask you today fill me with your holy spirit give me power to live for you every day help me to be on the winning team your winning team that I might live for you every day of the rest of my life and bring you glory. Jesus, forgive my sins. Wash me with your shed blood. Come into my heart afresh and anew. Let me be that wonderful servant that's trained in your house to follow you and win the battle. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord some praise right there. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Well, I want uh, Pastor Candy to come on down with these trophies, if y'all would bring them forward. I just love these balloons. Pastor Candy, if you'll get a microphone, dear. Somebody help her with a mic. Just put these trophies right down here so everybody can see them. Wow, first, second, and third place. Now let me tell you what's about to happen. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Candy in just a moment. Hey, y'all hold those balloons there. That looks great. I love Seahawks and Patriots. Two great teams. Amazing. But here's what I want you to do. As soon as the service is over, I'm going to ask you to stack your chairs and help us roll out the tables so everybody has a nice place to eat the chili, all right? And then we're going to ask all of our visitors and their